it's just not ever phoned in, man. We take this really very seriously. And I think we as a band um, are really, really conscious and loyal to maintaining um, the integrity of this body of work. We, we, Lamb of God is bigger than just me or even just the five of us. It's become its own entity. So we have to respect that legacy every time we release something, every time we add to it. We have to make sure we're, we're respecting that legacy that we worked so hard to establish. And uh, I really feel like this album does so much so that we self-titled it because we felt like it really, really represented where we are now, as I referenced earlier, as a veteran metal band um, with a pretty, pretty successful and pretty illustrious history, but still feeling very confident um, and, and, and very inspired creatively and very grateful to find ourselves there. Hey, I'm Mark Morton from Lamb of God, and this is the oral history of Lamb of God. In the beginning, we formed uh, as a band called Burn the Priest. And I can't stress enough the fact that we had absolutely no ambition of becoming a, a global heavy metal touring act at all. Our ambition was to um, really, to be perfectly honest, in the very beginning, it was more of a drinking club. Um, we would meet in um, the back rooms and basements of each other's little houses and apartments and make noise and, you know, kill a case of beer and do whatever else and just kind of write riffs and, and sort of enjoy playing them just for the pure kind of experience of that moment. It was, it was really, really kind of cool and, and um, genuine and honest. Um, we came up with the name Burn the Priest, uh, as I remember it, it was, we were kind of writing some music and just some real evil kind of sound. And you know, the early Burn the Priest stuff, anyone that's familiar with that, it just sounded really evil and, and scary and grimy. And it was like uttered that, man, that's some Burn the Priest type shit. And um, that's really kind of where it went. It wasn't anything, it wasn't a statement. It wasn't an attention grab. Um, it was really just kind of, um, I don't want to say it was a joke. It was just, you know, it was just seemed to fit. And, and we stuck with that for a while. And then as things progressed, I, it, it turns out that name got us a lot of attention, you know, given the context of the time and the sort of level we were at as a band. And as we got more serious about what we were doing creatively, and I think just as a band and, and our ambitions started to evolve and to grow a little bit, I think we realized that we had a ceiling um, with a name like that. And, and it, we were taking the band more seriously, I think at a certain point than, than we were presenting ourselves as. And that was really the catalyst behind it. I don't think there was necessarily a specific documented moment that you can pinpoint that we sort of turned left or turned right or, or, or rallied around some new um, campaign to become, you know, dominate the world or anything. I think it just really, and honestly, in terms of our whole career, if I think about it, it was always just a, a, a just kind of an evolving upward trajectory. Uh, I, I, you know, we released an album as Burn the Priest and we, we toured up and down Interstate 95 in our van doing that, playing wherever anyone would have us. And we played some festivals and we talked to some labels and that kind of thing. And, and really, I, I guess really the, 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 the defining moment in terms of the name was when we signed to Prosthetic Records because those conversations were all being done under the monikers of Burn the Priest. And I do remember a conversation with with uh, with Dan and EJ over there at Prosthetic, which was like, okay, this all sounds great, but by the way, we're changing the name. And, and as I remember it, it was like, you can't change the name, the name's great. Like you've built all this under the name, you can't change the name. It was like, we're changing the name. And they're like, what's, well, well, that's the new name and it's Lamb of God. And they're like, okay, cool. <laughs> Honestly, I don't really recall there being all that much difference um, between the process of the Burn the Priest album and New American Gospel. They were both recorded with Steve Austin, um, good friend, still a good friend. Um, those were very, um, for us as a band, they were certainly very naive times. They were very genuine in the sense that our songwriting and our approach to pretty much everything was just kind of in the moment and honest for better or worse. 
there was a lot of alcoholism going on um, and a, a lot of uh, you know youthful exuberance but there there's a purity in that um, in some of that and I think you can hear it in both those albums um, I think the budget was a little better uh, for gospel than burn the priest ironically I think burn the, in their original form I think burn the priest sounds better than gospel um, uh, there were probably some members of the band that were feeling themselves and felt like they had an idea of how to make things sound better and probably shouldn't have been tinkering. But that's, you know, that's all part of the learning process. Well, you know, to be fair, we were all learning as we went and we made mistakes all along the way, all of us. So I don't re recall there being that much difference in terms of the process, but I think we did realize, and it's been a long time, man, it's been 20 years, but I, I think we did realize that we were certainly elevating as a band to a kind of a new, a new expanded sort of visibility. And there was a, you know, Prosthetic was uh, the new label and they were a subsidiary of Metal Blade. And we, we felt like at the time, and I think it was, I think it's fair to say that that was a big deal. And that was a big step up for us. And we were aware enough to know that we would have resources available to us that we hadn't before. I mean, the Burning Priest album was done on Legion Records, which was Mikey Brosnan. Rest in peace, Mikey, man. And without him, um, there wouldn't have been any of this. And it was literally him probably on a credit card funding th that album and selling them at shows and, and, you know, us selling boxes at a time out of our van. And if you listen to New American Gospel and then listen to Sacrament, I mean, there's such an evolution in there. And that's, you know, it's two albums in between um, and, you know, maybe five or six years. So, and then again, you know, between Sacrament and say Storm and Drown or, or even, you know, the new album, it, it just evolves, it changes. I don't think we've ever necessarily um, settled or, or, or stayed put on any particular sound um, for all that long. I, you know, it's a, it's, in my mind, we're a thrash metal band. Um, we're just kind of a contemporary thrash metal band and, and our roots, as far as I'm concerned, are in bay area thrash um with some pantera and some slayer and randy's punk rock element and some some european mashuga and at the gates and that kind of thing and you you shake all that around in a snow globe and it comes down and as lamb of god and, and i mean that it's you know we just evolve over time and uh, i guess my my answer to that is i don't i don't know that we've ever found a sound that we were willing to commit to forever it just is it's where we're at at any given point in time. As the palaces burn and ashes are both breakthroughs in their own way. I mean, but again, like each, that's the, I think one of the things I cherish so much about our journey as a band is every step was a breakthrough. I mean, Burn the Priest was a breakthrough because it was our first album. I could have been done right there. I put out an album, holy moly. And then, and then uh, you know, Gospel is released on a subsidiary of Metal Blade. And then Palaces comes out and we were really starting to get some, you know, had the ruined video was on MTV and we were getting tour opportunities that were, you know, bigger than we'd ever done. Ashes of the Wake was our first major label album. The pressure that came with that, uh, I still remember because we, you know, had now, we're on Epic Records, we're, we're label mates with some of these huge acts and we really didn't know what the measure of success was and what was expected of us. and how to navigate that and there's there was no lesson there was no um there was no book to read or, or really no mentor reaching down to us saying you know do this we just kind of had to figure it out fortunately we did sacrament was a huge album for us and redneck was kind of a, a hit of, of the time so really every step of the way and, and that's just an album's release and thing and then touring again kind of going up the ladder and all of a sudden finding ourselves opening for slipknot in arenas and it's just been each each step, each rung of the ladder has been um, kind of groundbreaking in its own way. I remember distinctly feeling a very clear kind of feeling that we were up, we were about to embark on something that was unlike anything anywhere we had been. It, it, I, I remember feeling this very kind of next big thing feeling about our band and really about the movement in general. There were a lot of our peers that were signing pretty big record deals and we were we were all sticking together. I did a podcast about this not long ago and I, I, I remember thinking that 
even in that moment, while we were competitive with bands like Killswitch and Shadows Fall, God forbid, and Unearth, and and all those, we were all in that together, and we all knew what was good for one of us was good for all of us. So it really was, um, a, there was a sense of unity, and it was exciting to watch those other bands do well, um, and know that we were a kind of a part of that wave, um, while at the same time throwing our elbows and wanting to prove that you know we had. Um, something that other people didn't. We knew that as collectively, there was something really special happening. And, and, and I knew that sort of right on the cusp of it happening and while it was happening. And it was a really, really unique um, and powerful feeling to be a part of something like that. Just exciting, really exciting. I think for us, there was always a little bit of uniqueness in the sense that so much of that movement was centered in New England and Massachusetts in particular, and Northeast, top of it, New Jersey. And while we were all, you know, kindred, there was something sort of detached from us. We had this kind of grimy, uniquely Richmond kind of punk rock DNA um, that I think a lot of those other bands in that scene had their own version of that, which was hardcore. Um, the hardcore movements in, up, up that way. And there was certainly a hardcore scene here, but we, we were so, we were more, uh, you know, kind of warehouse, grimy, punk rock element. Um, we always kind of saw ourselves as a little bit of this, their Southern cousins, you know? And so we just sort of had this slightly different aesthetic. We looked, we dressed a little different and, and we were a little, a little drunker and a little grimier and a little scummier and just a little more raw. I, I, I think, I don't mean that as a comparison. I just think we, we, we just kind of had this weird, just an ever so slightly different uh, aesthetic about us, I think. Uh, I don't know that that's better or worse. I think there were times when that might've worked against us and um, it, just, it just is what it is. I mean, there were so many great bands in that movement and we were really close with all of those guys and still are. Um, and I'm just really proud, more than anything, to have been a part of that time, um, to still be here for sure. Uh, but it was really, really special, man. It was a really special time for all of us. There was certainly an intense amount of pressure uh, going into Ashes of the Wake. That moment was not lost on, certainly not me, I don't think on any of us, that we were graduating to a major label. The visibility, the profile, the expectations, the budgets, um, the stakes, just by and large, were gonna be a lot higher. And they were. And for, so moving on to Sacrament, I mean, even doing Ashes, I remember being very cognizant of this idea that this might not last. This is a, enjoy this moment. I felt pressure and I remember kind of that weighing heavy on me. But at the same time, I, I knew like, this is really spectacular opportunity and enjoy this moment because, uh, you know, you won't always have the opportunity to write and record it. Or, you know, major label albums. So by the time we got to Sacrament, the, the other difference too is in Ashes, we had just pretty much just released Palaces and then we signed to Epic. So as I recall it, there was, and I'm pretty sure there wasn't much time in between Palaces and Ashes because we're on a new label and they want their, you know, they want to strike while they're on top, so they want their product. So we had to write Ashes really fast. And, and I remember, um, it's funny how people celebrate Ashes, and, I, and in hindsight, I do think it's, it's, got a, it's, it's just kind of a moment in time that was special for a lot of people, and it was a lot of people's introduction to Lamb of God. For my part, I thought the album was flawed, and I, I felt like, um, it, it, while good and while I'm proud of it, I think there was, there was potential um, as songwriters and for me as a player that wasn't realized. So for Sacrament, going into that, um, I went personally and, and you get five different stories from five different guys but for me I went into that feeling like um, like I uh, I a little I think I had a little something to prove as a songwriter and as a player and I wanted to up the game because um, I was I felt grateful that we had done well enough with ashes to get another chance you know, to make a record at that level but I felt like um, I wanted to I wanted to hit the ball a little further. It was just a matter of experience and kind of really the theme for me has been learning to trust your own artistry. I still apply that, um, you know, not long ago, kind of shifting gears here, but not long ago, I started kind of solo projects. I released a solo album, a solo EP, and, and that was a kind of a new level of new style of vulnerability for me to put my name on it and to do music that 
sounded different stylistically. And, and I really kind of referenced those times like Sacrament where um, I, f I felt a little vulnerable, but I also was learning to, to trust um, my ability and, and trust my judgment as a songwriter. Our, I say my a lot, you know, because I'm trying to speak for myself and not anyone else. It's always been a collaborative band. Um, everyone contributes. So when I say my or me, it's because I'm coming from my experience. It's not because I'm staking claim to our success. Uh, I, I do think I want to make that clear. But for me, in my role and my position as one of five, um, I was learning to um, to believe in what we were doing and, and to be willing to take risks. And I think if you listen to Ashes and listen to Sacrament back to back, there are a lot of stylistic differences. There's a lot of us stretching out and I. Now, you know, I, I think Ashes is beautiful. And, and again, I, 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 there were mistakes I thought we made. Um, people would disagree. And the beauty of this stuff is, is that um, once we write, record the album, release it, it's no longer mine. I can just listen to it and critique it just like you can, but it just exists, becomes its own thing. But for Sacrament, you know, I felt like, you know, they, they're very, very different sounding records. One is significantly um, produced in a very different way. Same producer, same team on those albums, they just sound really different. And what you hear is kind of us, um, and I think Machine as well, um, stretching out, stretching out within the context of Lamb of God. And uh, again, I, I could say the same thing for Sacrament I'm saying about Ashes, there are, are mistakes. There are songs that I, I would have done different things with now. And, um, but, you know, it's it stood the test of time and it's, uh, I'm proud of them both moments that I'm most proud of in the career of Lamb of God? That's a tricky question, man, because you're talking about a 25 year uh, career. It's more than half of my life and it's in a lot of ways creatively, it's my life's work. So to narrow that down into into three moments is really, it's, it's frankly impossible. Um, I'll say that I'm proud of our body of work um, collectively. I think it's, um, it's, it's a large body of work. We've worked hard. We've been very prolific, released a lot of material. And I think if you listen to it start to finish from Burn the Priest till the album that comes out Friday, you, you, you hear the story of a band evolving and you hear um, a lot of personal experience and you hear a lot of, uh, you know, successes and victories and, and, and a lot of troubled times and challenges too and, and, and that's honest so i think we've been really genuine so i guess I, i'd say i'm really proud of the quality of our body work and the amount of work we've put into it um, i'm proud of how genuine and honest we are creatively we've never made a single decision in the course of 25 years um, based on what we thought we wanted what we thought the fans might want to hear or what a label might want to hear or what a journalist or a critic might want to hear those things never come into play at all um, I'm proud of that, and uh, I'm proud to still be here, man. I'm proud to still have the opportunity, I'm grateful to still have the opportunity to make music and to still feel like what we're doing is um, inspired creatively. It means something to us, uh, and that we get to be a part of um, bringing people joy through music, honestly. So the evolution of us as, as people and as individuals in the process of that creating, you know, that body of work over, 25 years you know we've all been through a lot of changes so I think in the beginning you hear uh, again a very naive very sort of dumb innocence in terms of um, what we thought we could get away with um, and it's really ragged and rough around the edges but there's there's a beauty in that and there's you know it, it would be ill-fitting now but in our 20s with you know 1500 bucks to make a record in three days it it there's a magic to it and you know as the palace is burned notoriously sounds like crap and people say would you re-record that never because it's that's part of the character of that album it sounds like it's about to melt and and that's rad you know would that work now no <laughs> we make demos that sound better than that now um but it's it's just a point in time so um, you know, for us, you're talking about over half my life that I'm writing and recording these songs. So all the changes that I've gone through as a human um, 
as a person as you know have gone into those songs and i, I write um lyrically about personal experience so you know you hear me um battling with addiction you hear me uh navigating the death of my first daughter you hear um conflict and resolution in my relationship with my father and those are just in the songs that i write wrote lyrically you know what i mean so i think it's really um we're very exposed and honest and vulnerable as a band uh certainly lyrically and i i think musically those things on a sort of subconscious level are there too so how have we evolved we've evolved in every way as a band and as creative people that we've evolved as as as, as individuals what you hear on this new album is the sound of a band that um feels confident and comfortable where we are and it took a lot for us to get here individually and collectively and i think we are um proud and grateful to be in that moment as a band as i recall uh with wrath we it was very much a rebound to sacrament again not to make up for i think we were responding to what we had done with sacrament sacrament was very produced very layered um very a lot of effects and and you know external production going on and i remember with wrath us kind of rallying the, around the idea of we wanted it to sound like if lamb of god set up in your living room and played a really really tight set of, of new material we wanted it to be raw and aggressive um and kind of you know relentless and i think it is and it, it was also our first it wasn't the first time we worked with josh wilbur but it was our first time with him um as producer and it was also his first production um, he was a very, very accomplished engineer at that point with a, with a huge discography of incredibly successful works that he'd work on. But as a producer, that was his first work. So we all kind of felt um, really fired up about that. And, and I think we took on that energy too, where we, uh, we were excited about, we, we sort of in, in a lot of ways felt um, we felt free at that point in time, as I remember, to, to really make the make make a record without expectation other than our own, um, which we had always done. But I think it was done with anxiety, and with with wrath. I think we, we uh, other than you know rallying around Josh and that being his first big work. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of talking in circles. I just remember it just being really genuine, you know, and and really free of anxiety, and and I, I think. Personally, again, everyone's got a different opinion. And once you put these things out into the world, um, they, they belong to whoever's listening to it. And I truly believe that. But in terms of that older stuff, I think Wrath has aged as probably better than anything. So with, with Resolution, I feel like us as a band, we were, we were kind of a big ball of yarn all mixed up. I think that in, in hindsight, could have been one of our strongest albums if we had just been willing to, as Randy calls it, kill our darlings. Meaning like we were all fighting within the band for specific songs that we felt some sort of emotional connection to. And, and our answer to it wound up being just put it all on there. Um, and I think it just was sort of a, just kind of, it, as as an album i think it's a little long i think i think we could have edited ourselves a little bit and and maybe vetted the track list a little better it's just my opinion i'm sure there's people out there that'll watch this and maybe that's their maybe that's their favorite album again it's it's just my opinion i think there are some of our best songs are on resolution but um i think it's it's the the water's a little bit muddy with kind of some some of our not greatest songs that at the time, for whatever reason, people were fighting to put them on to and, and put them on the album. And I, I think, again, that's one of those things you learn as you go. You, you, you're you always learning. And we were pretty well into our career at that point, um, but obviously still learning. And so that, that, that would be my take on that album. Storm and Drang was definitely uh, reacted to that. I think we were uh, aware internally um, the, the, the team, the band and our producer were, were aware that we had sort of uh, made a bit of a mistake on that last album and just including too much material. And again, not, not vetting that material 
Um, there's always extra stuff, you know, almost always. And there's a reason that all of it doesn't make it on. And sometimes stuff gets put to the side and worked on a little more and shows up later. And that's cool. So I think with Storm and Drang, we, um, we were really focused on that. We were, we, we really kind of, um, sort of refined that focus to making sure it's an album that you can listen to start to finish and it feels cohesive and it feels like it moves correctly. And, and, and I think it does. I mean, I think that's one of our better sounding albums and top, top to bottom. It's, it's, um, it's pretty consistently good. So with the new self-titled album, the question is what did we achieve that we haven't achieved? And I would say um, our our eighth studio album. <laughs> um, you know, there's no, um, we, we didn't make a, a black metal album. We didn't make a punk rock record. We didn't make a rap metal album. Um, we stayed true to what Lamb of God sounds like. And we stayed true to what the five of us sound like in the room when we were writing those songs. Uh, obviously, we have a new drummer that brings a new kind of energy. It brings a new, um, it changes the chemistry a little bit. And that was exciting. It was exciting to have Arts, um, you know, he's about 15 years younger than all of us. And so there's a, a, a an excitement and an energy and a, and a kind of a youthful exuberance that he brings into the room that's infectious. It's uh, exciting to see him with his eyes and ears wide open and taking all of this in and really, really knocking it out of the park. Um, and that's uh, inspiring to us as a band. It's inspiring to me as a songwriter. Uh, so, you know, th those, those dynamics are different. This, you know, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, you know, you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't in a lot of ways, because if I say this sounds like a Lamb of God album, there were people that will say, well, yeah, you're making the same album over for the last five times. I don't believe that's so. You know, I think this album is very, very lyrically, very current, very topical. I think we've shifted again um, from this time from writing sort of personal and introspectively to now writing about what we see happening around us. And we've kind of, that pendulum's gone back and forth uh, a couple times over the course of eight albums. And um, I think it's, it's some of the, some, it's got some of Randy's best lyrics. Um, I think particularly the lyrics to reality bath are chilling and very poignant. And um, you know, we just work so hard on these things, man. We work really hard on these albums. Um, every detail, every detail, the, the track, the, 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 the sequence of the tracks, the order in which they go in. Um, every song is written and rewritten and demoed and redemoed and every lyric scrutinized and every pattern. And, and, you know, I flew back out to LA to recut guitar solos because I wasn't happy with the ones I cut in the original sessions. Um, and all but one were re-recorded because I just didn't, they were, they were good, but they weren't good enough. You know, how will I remember Lamb of God? I'll remember it in a lot of different ways. I mean, again, I think the theme of this interview has just been, it's just been an evolution and it's been, it's been half a lifetime. And so it means a lot of different things to me. Um, I think the most, uh, exciting thing to me about the whole journey is that we have been able to be a small part of a system that puts music into people's lives. And people, and I mean this with all sincerity, people really uh, hold on to that, to, to that music that we've had a part in making and it becomes a part of their lives and it becomes a soundtrack to, um, you know, all kinds of different things, good and bad, and they hold on to that and it touches their lives in a really very personal way. And for me and us as a band to just be a part of that system is, uh, it's really something that's not lost on us and it's really something special. And I'm just grateful uh, to be able to bring joy to people through the music that I get to play, play a part in making.